Welcome to the Relationship Recovery Podcast, hosted by Jessica Knight, a certified life coach who specializes in narcissistic and emotional abuse. This podcast is intended to help you identify manipulative and abusive behavior, set boundaries with yourself and others, and heal the relationship with yourself so you can learn to love in a healthy way. Today, I have Tessa Noel of Kind Mama Divorce Coaching. Tessa is a certified divorce transition and recovery coach and certified co-parenting specialist with extensive knowledge in multiple life coaching frameworks. She is a wealth of knowledge on high conflict divorce and co-parenting with a narcissist. Today, we talk about the ins and outs of divorcing a narcissist and what it's like to co-parent, and strategies to keep yourself sane. I highly recommend listening to this episode with a pen and paper in hand, especially if you are co-parenting with a narcissist or you are in a high-conflict divorce and really letting some of the lessons sit with you. Hi, Tessa. Thank you for joining me today. Hi, Jessica. Thank you so much for having me. Can you share a little bit about you and what you do? Sure. My name is Tessa Noel. I'm a certified divorce coach and co-parenting specialist. I live in San Diego. I have two children. They are six and eight years old. I am practicing a long distance co-parenting plan with my Mm co-parent. And the reason that I do what I do is because of, you know, five and a half years ago when I went through my high conflict divorce. I was driven to protect my children from the conflict of my divorce. And so I poured myself into research and to taking classes and and just to learning how I could do that. And through that path, I kind of found my purpose is I wanted to help other moms who who were going through a high conflict divorce and co-parenting. So um, that's what I do. And now I am fortunate to be able to work with moms every day uh, to teach them strategies uh, for co-parenting and setting boundaries and then just picking up the pieces and creating a new life after divorce. Yeah. Yeah. How do you actually define high conflict or high conflict divorce? Like if somebody is listening to this and they're like, I don't know if it's high conflict or not, what would be some of the things that they're going through to be able to know that it's a high conflict divorce? Um, So they might not know. They might not know that this is not, this is not normal. This is not typical. Um, I sure didn't. (laughs) Yeah. Um, If if you're ending up in, in family court, there's going to be some some level of high high conflict because it's gotten to the point where I don't know if you know this, but everyone has a prenup, and the prenup are the laws uh, regarding property and custody in your state. So if you're going through the process and one of you does not want to abide by those or thinks yeah. that they're entitled to something more, or maybe that the rules don't apply to them, then you're going to find yourself working with. Uh, high price lawyers in family court. And every little thing that you come across is going to be a challenge, uh, whether it's your parenting plan or splitting assets. Um, any part of the process is there's going to be obstacles because one person <laughs> is deciding that uh, they don't want to split the assets. They're not going to be disclosing any assets, as a matter of fact, or they don't, they don't have a W-2 all of a sudden. So you're going to end up having to pay to subpoena those records. Um, Just things like that, that are kind of big red flags that tell you, uh, this is not going to be the easiest route. This is not an amicable divorce. In an amicable divorce, preferably, you're going to work together to get all of the financial disclosure done, you're going to create a parenting plan that puts the children's ages and school schedule first, and you're going to work together to to get through the process. So if you're basically experiencing the opposite of that, 
that's what I would consider a high conflict divorce. Also, if there's been any any sort of um, abuse, you know, mm-hmm. it, it can be incredibly high conflict. Yeah, yeah. And um, something that I tell my clients often is that it only takes one person to make a divorce high conflict. Like it doesn't mean that they're all they're also contributing to the problem. Like one person can actually be making it more high conflict. And um, to kind of remember that if that's the dynamic that's happening, you know, I love that you just frame that it's if you're in the family court system, you have a high conflict divorce. Like there's other ways to that this we can go about divorcing and separating and all of that. There's so many other ways. And so when my clients tell me that's what, you know, in their, in their right in the beginning of it. And I say, okay, well, what's, you know, let's paint a picture. What's the kind of divorce that you see yourself having? And, and ideally everybody wants that. I want to be able to work together with my soon to be ex to figure out what's best for our children, how to go about splitting the assets. What's the fastest, easiest path. Nobody wants the high conflict divorce. Um, and so I, I'm just there to like, let's look at your options. These are the options you have. Uh, um, let's work together. Let's figure that out. Yeah. But yes, in the high, high conflict divorce, it's, I'm, I'm going to, you know, or they are going to uh, hire the, the bulldog attorney right away. Um, that's another big red flag. The, the attorney that's known in town for being aggressive, not necessary not necessarily skilled <laughs> yeah. Um, um, because that's what, that's what the high conflict person is looking to do. They're looking to bully you. Mm-hmm. Right. And so we're, you know, we're calling this person high conflict. We can call them toxic. Um, a lot of people will ask me, how do I know if I'm co-parenting with a narcissist, which a narcissist would fall into the category of high conflict and toxic. But I, I almost like one of my questions for you is how, what are some signs that show, you know, that a client that show you, you know, that a client is actually co-parenting or trying to co-parent with a narcissist or I, but I feel like we can just rephrase that and say, what are some signs of a high conflict co-parenting relationship? Um, so I, there isn't a client <laughs> yeah. that has been in, in a high conflict divorce that hasn't identified their co-parent as a narcissist. Got it. Narcissist is a relatable term and I don't have a problem with people using it because that tells me, look, I'm dealing with these specific symptoms. And usually by the time a, you know, a client is telling me they're going through a high conflict divorce and they think their co-parent's a narcissist, they've already gone on to the DSM-5 and looked up those, um, those symptoms of a narcissist. And they're seeing that their co-parent is checking all the boxes. They've got the the grandiose uh, sense of self. They've got the entitlement. They have a complete lack of empathy. And these things are showing up during their divorce um, as, you know, them making decisions that are in no way what's best for the children, um, but purely to hurt the other parent. Or they're... Um, they're just, oh, another big thing is narcissists create their own reality, right? And they've got to create this smear campaign while they're going through the divorce process to be able to justify what they've done to end the marriage, right? And they have to come up with their own story. So then then they're, they're having to put their co-parent in this category that they are now the villain of the story, right? And by simply... It, existing and being a compassionate, good parent, you're going against that false narrative that the narcissist has created. And you're, you're public enemy number one. Yeah. <laughs> so they're not going at this divorce as a collaborative attempt and an amicable end to a marriage. They're going at it as you're the enemy and I'm going to destroy you at all costs. Yeah. And unfortunately, I'm go- and I'm going, I mean, I think it feels like, like they have to win no matter what, like when you're on the other side of that, it's like, no matter what happens, no matter how wrong or right things are, they need to win. And f- every fact can be changed and every lie 
you know, can be manipulated into like a bigger lie to just prove the point that you're awful and they're going to win. They're going to win at any way possible. If that means falsely accusing you of abuse so that you don't have custody of your children, they'll do that. If it means falsely accusing you of spousal abuse so that you don't get to collect spousal support, they're going to do that. It means just they don't have these boundaries that an empathetic person would have. They have a goal in mind and they're going to get that any way that they can. The good news is if you give a narcissist enough rope in family court, they're going to hang themselves. So by consistently making up their their own version of reality, they're also going to destroy their own credibility in family court by you know making up lies about you that are unfounded and it takes a while, you know, in family court for the judge to eventually see who the high conflict co-parent actually is because they have to go ahead and hear out every story and, and they have to be fair. But unfortunately, you know, coming out of a relationship like that, oftentimes the safe parent can show up as the high conflict co-parent in family court. Yeah. So let's actually touch on that. and how the healthy parent can show up as high conflict. And I, my guess is that it's because they are the ones that are bringing up a lot of these issues. They probably have like all the documentation. They're desperately trying to get the judge to see like what's going on. And they most likely are also very dysregulated. Like, and because they're, they're caretaking the kids, they're trying to caretake themselves. They're dealing with this, you know, with all the lies and the manipulation. I want to almost talk about what that looks like when the, healthy parent is showing up as the high conflict parent. What do you think, in your opinion, that the judge is seeing? Okay, so this is how the safe parent can often be misconstrued as the high conflict parent in family court. Someone coming out of narcissistic abuse is going to be hyper vigilant about protecting themselves and protecting their children from that abuse. What that can be misinterpreted as is gatekeeping the children when say they've always been the primary caregiver of these children, the other parent has never had an active role in the children's lives, doesn't know the children's schedule, doesn't know the children's pediatrician. And so that safe parent is just defaulting into the role of primary caregiver. But then all of a sudden during a divorce, no matter what age or stage of readiness the children are, that high conflict co-parent is going to say, okay, 50-50 with overnights, even if you have a six-month-old breastfeeding baby, they're going to be like, I'm entitled to it. That's my right, right? When a a normal (laughs) situation, Mm -hmm. like this dynamic did not exist during the time of marriage. So why would we risk the health and well-being of our child to all of a sudden disrupt their world by changing that? That's obviously not what's in the best interest of the child. So, but that's another big red flag is one of the parents going after what they believe they have rights to or entitled to rather than easing the children into a gradual step up plan uh, that, that helps the children adjust to being in a different type of custody situation. Everyone knows that what children need during a divorce is stability, consistency, familiarity, and a very gradual change in the status quo, then where you have the safe parent fighting for that, it might be misrepresented in court as one parent keeping the children from the other parent when they're really just trying to protect their children from the conflict of the divorce. Yeah. And it's almost like the narcissist or the high conflict persons, uh, their ideas around co-parenting or their ideas of what they should, in air quotes, be getting typically are at the beginning in line with what the court is kind of wanting, right? The court has all these ideas of like equal parental rights and all of this without, they typically are not looking into the details of what's actually happening. They're seeing people as a number, a case number. They do. And their goal is to get it resolved as quickly as possible. And if it means ordering, because family court loves shared custody, they love 50-50. 
and some states even default to that. Yeah. Thankfully, in some states, it's still best interest of the child, which means you're going to look at the age, you're going to look at the child's needs, and you're going to look at what the relationship was like during the marriage. And then you're going to, going to give the children a, a, a fair amount of time to kind of ease into their new normal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I live in a state where it's best interest of the child. Um, and there's a lot of criteria actually online of what the best interests are. And then, but I do work with people in other states and I have one client where the custody is literally split up. Like, I believe it's like 65, 35%. And I just like could not wrap my mind around like a child being split in a percentage, but it was, it was just mind boggling. But like every state is so different. And I think like the key here is that the healthy parent, the safe parent is usually always focused on the best interest of the child, regardless of anybody else's. And that can be so disorienting for them. Right. And that's another big red flag when you see, if you think that you might be involved in a high conflict divorce, is you see these parents coming in and they're not talking about, well, let's talk about our child's schedule. Let's talk about their health and nutrition needs. Let's talk about their school schedule. Let's talk about whether I'm actually even available for my parenting time. They're speaking in percentages. I want 50-50, period. I want overnight. I want 50-50 with overnights. It's always transactional. Everything for a narcissist or a high conflict parent is transactional. Whereas you see the safe parent is saying, I don't know if 50-50 is right just yet. If there's a way that we can, you know, work up to that, And that right there is that hesitancy is what, well, why wouldn't that parent be able to have 50-50? That's their right. But that is a red flag when you, as a co-parenting specialist, if I hear someone saying, well, I want, when I ask them, what kind of parenting plan do you think your children should have? And if they immediately respond with a number, that's a red flag because children aren't the percentage. That's, we're not going to cut the baby in half. Okay. Like, (laughs) yeah, yeah. The time King Solomon that's obviously not what's best. And that's, I think, what family court kind of just defaults to sometimes. And I don't think it's right. Yeah. Well, we haven't like said this out right, but something that's going on is the post-separation abuse that the healthy parent is also is getting from the toxic parent. And so can you define for us what post-separation abuse is and then how it's actually showing up in this dynamic? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Eye-opening moments podcasts are real-life stories of adversity, encounters, and perspectives. They are moments that can lift your spirits, give you some food for thought, or move you. For the introspective mind that likes to reflect, discover, and find solutions or meaning in a complex life, listen to Eye-opening moments podcasts. So post-separation abuse is basically the abuse that occurred in the marriage, and it's going to continue to be inflicted by the high-conflict co-parent. So if in your marriage you were being financially controlled, you were being coercively controlled, those things don't stop because you sign divorce papers. They still show up in your co-parenting after divorce, and they show up like them withholding your support child support unless you come back to them. You know, I'm going to do this to have assert my power and control over you because you have no other choice because I can still control you with this one thing. So you see parents, I'm not going to let you see the kids unless you do this, right? Or I'm not going to pay child support unless you do this. Anything that they can control you with, um, they're going to be bullying you, harassing you, stalking you online. Um, threatening to take you back to court, any of these things. And I think Tina Swith, Swithin even created a post-separation abuse wheel yeah. where it's all the different kinds. And they will, the legal abuse, post-separation legal abuse, if they don't get their way, they're they're going to threaten to take you back to court and they will take you back to court. And that's litigation abuse. And there's just all different ways where this high conflict co-parent can find to control your actions through asserting this control and this abuse, even after you separate, which is really sad because a lot of people think, okay, I'm leaving this abusive marriage and finally I get my chance to be free, but then they're still being 
controlled and manipulated through this post-separation abuse. And it's really sad because when I have clients that come to me, the way that these parents are just looking for freedom after their divorce and they're afraid, it shows up as extreme fear, self-doubt, feeling completely overwhelmed, and then just afraid to even be a parent and show up in their children's lives, afraid to plan a vacation, you know, a weekend vacation with their kids because they know they ask to ask their co-parent, hey, is it okay if we maybe miss one day of school so that we can go visit my family or whatever? They're going to get the just backlash from their co-parent. Like, no, they can't miss school. And, or they're going to get a transactional reply. They're going to be like, you know, you're only allowed to take our kids out of the state if you give me Christmas with them this year. Just totally not good co-parent. Counter-parenting yeah. is yeah. what they do, right? And so, yeah, that's when I see my clients are going through it. They're just constantly messaging me. What should I say back to this person? What can I do to make it so that he'll let me do this, right? And they're just afraid to be parents. And it's just sucking the joy of, of being a parent out of them. So well, that sounds like they're, afraid. What, I mean, they're afraid to be people though. Like it's like, you know, they're afraid to be parents, but they're also afraid to be like people. They're afraid to make plans because they don't know what mess is coming their way or what, yes. if they're going to be mm-hmm. like thrown back into court or when everything's a problem, it's like they have to brace themselves for every single thing that they do, even when it's like legally fine, you know, when it's legal and it's within the parenting plan, it's within their rights. It, it feels so disorienting. And so when people it, do it come mm-hmm. to you and they're like, well, what do I, how do I even like, a, how do I even approach them? I'm guessing gray rock in this scenario doesn't work because the court will see you as being high conflict. So what do you, yeah, so in a lot of, in a lot of states, one of the factors that they look at when determining custody is your ability to co-parent. So if you're gray rocking somebody, it can be misconstrued in family court as an inability to co-parent because you're not being responsive. You're not working together. You're not co-parenting. Again, I do like Tina Swithin through One Mom's Battle. She created like this yellow rocking, which is a version of gray rocking, which if you don't know what gray rocking is, it's just being as close to no contact as possible with this person and as just one word answers so that they kind of just as boring as possible so that they just leave you alone. And then the yellow rocking method is kind of a that, but friendly, right? So it, it's more of a add a friendly greeting to that and keep up the appearance that you're being a good, you know, actively involved co-parent. I actually came up with my own kind of methods. It's called the, the kind method of co-parenting communication. I do recommend that if you are communicating with a high conflict co-parent, you don't have phone conversations with them because Mm -hmm. anything can happen. Everything needs to be recorded. You either need to be using email or exclusively using a uh, parenting app like Talking Parents. So in this kind method that I've I've kind of come up with, it's a method of high conflict co-parenting communication. It's all in writing. And the case stands for keep it short. You're never going to send your co-parent a paragraph, right? Because they're not going to read it anyway. They're not going to read it or they're going to pick things out of it to misunderstand on purpose (laughs) and then use those things against you later, right? So if your co-parent is messaging you, who knows why? They need some validation that day. They need to see if they still have access to you. So they're going to make up a, a reason to message you. They're going to message you asking about the time of picking up the kids tomorrow and blah, blah, blah. And by the way, you're a bad parent. And by the way, you act inappropriately on your social media. There's going to be peppered in with insults, criticism, false allegations, whatever. So you're going to look at that message and you're going to see, do I even need to respond to this? If it's pertaining to the children's schedule, if it's pertaining to something having to do with the children that is like timely, you're going to need to respond. So you're going to keep it short is what the K stands for. Maybe three or four sentences at most. The I stands for it in forms of the answer only, right? You're not going to be offering advice. Maybe you shouldn't talk to me that way. You know, nothing like that. You're just going to loop gray rock, yellow rock, just 
pick up t- tomorrow as is at 9 a.m. You're not going to even add as usual. Don't even know why you're asking nothing. You're just yeah. in form of the answer. We're not going to explain ourselves. And then the N stands for nice. Be nice. So you have to go in even after, after you type it out and look at it and say, is this nice? Mm-hmm. Is this nice but not condescending? Is this customer service nice? You're not going to use words like unfortunately because that's going to trigger your, your high conflict co-parent. You're going to go back in and you're going to add a hello. And then at the end of it, you're going to add a have a nice day or whatever. Just make it friendly. Make it nice. And then the D stands for it determines the end of the conversation. We're not going to leave it open-ended. We're not going to ask a question. We're going to say... Pickup is tomorrow at 9 a.m. See you then. Period. Put the phone down. No more, right? We're not going to say, is that okay with you? (laughs) Is there a reason you're asking? No, 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 no. We don't want to keep this conversation going because when it comes down to it, it's not about, you know, pick up tomorrow at nine. It's because they are looking to pick a fight. They're looking to see if they can get some sort of validation from you. And we need to completely rewrite the whole dynamic of the relationship that existed while you were married or while you were together and basically train your high conflict co-parent that that does not exist anymore. You will not allow that to exist anymore. And you're moving forward in a professional, friendly manner, whether they want to comply or not. It's not up to them. Yeah. You know, when you mentioned that, like in reading these emails or reading these communications to make like, look, okay, what actually has to do with the kid? What do you tell parents to do if it actually has nothing to do with the kid? So, but they're claiming that it does. So say, for example, like somebody went out or they just started dating someone and it's like, maybe it's Mm -hmm. like, you know, it's one month in, it's brand new, the kid I mean, my daughter would know if I went out on a date. So like if they, like the kid might know, maybe the kid mentioned it and they're like insisting to meet that person. But that it really has nothing to do with the kid. Like the kid hasn't met the person. The right. parent is living their life. Like what would be a kind way to just respond to almost like end that, but also look good for the family court system? So that's where boundaries come in. And yeah. so a great boundary is a parenting plan. So if that's something that you've addressed in your parenting plan, like we've agreed not to introduce new partners for, you know, a year after whatever, then that's fine. And you could always default to that boundary, to that parenting plan. If it doesn't, and it kind of doesn't really have anything to do with the kids, and it's not really any of your ex's business, and as long as your child is safe and happy at your house, it's none of your co-parents' business what you're doing with your dating life. It really isn't. As long as you're not saying that specifically, none of your business to your co-parent, right? But kind of just a friendly response like, thank you for your concern. You know, because you are an adult and you are a parent and you are entitled to it your own life. If it doesn't have to do, first of all, you don't have to respond. Yeah. You don't. You honestly, not at all. Like it cannot even be an issue. If you'd like to come up with a friendly way to tell them to stay in their lane, you can do that too. <laughs> but that's something I would have to put a lot of brain power into like figuring right. out specifically the answer. And one of the reasons that I've learned to do this is because, you know, I was going a lot, going to my own, you know, attorney, spending $350 for an hour for her to like craft an email for me or write a letter for me. And I said, you know what? I can learn how to do this myself. (laughs) And I did. And um, there's amazing, friendly methods of communication that you can just kind of plug in your own situation and figure out there's a formula for that. I can just plug it into this and it's not triggering them. It's not making them want to press harder. It's it's kind of just ending this conversation, letting them know like, I've got this, it's fine. We don't need to talk about it anymore. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, I'm glad you brought up the whole lawyer thing. I found myself doing very similar things of reaching out to my lawyer who is $400 an hour and then spending money right. doing this when there's, you know, there are coaches and people like you that are trained that can really like 
provide some of that support because you've not only have gone down that path, but you've also have other training in how to how to respond to this and also what boundaries are, right? Like, and like what that really looks like and helping people craft what that is for them. And so I know that you work with a lot of people that are in that space and they probably feel like they're going crazy half the time. How do you help people like begin to heal and kind of find their own sanity? I'm sure boundaries is a big component of that, but I imagine there's a lot more to it. I 100% agree. So what I find my clients dealing with is they're trying, they're struggling with, do I need to stick to my boundaries on this one? Do I need to just only abide by the parenting plan? Or is this something that I can be flexible with, right? The amazing thing about boundaries is once you've set them, boom, that's your boundary, right? So I had a client whose co-parent was coming into the car and yelling at them for not paying child support on time in front of the children. So that's an obvious, we don't do that, never, ever. That's a bound, but a boundary needs to be set there. So I helped them craft a message to their co-parent saying like, I don't want you to approach my car anymore and you won't speak about adult issues in front of the children anymore. And then, you know, there's a consequence. If you don't, I won't be a pickup anymore. I will send someone else to come pick up the children, right? And the day after they set the boundary, boom, the, the co-parent didn't come out to the car anymore. And boom, that boundary was set and it was amazing. How you figure out whether you need to set a boundary with your co-parent is how you feel. If you're feeling triggered, if you're feeling emotional, if you're obsessing over something, you're stressing over it, your body's telling you there's a clear need for a boundary here. So what I tell my parents that I work with is in determining whether to set a firm boundary or be flexible, you're going to ask yourself these three questions, right? First and foremost, how does this benefit my children, right? If your co-parent's asking for maybe one of your parenting days, if something is happening that's upsetting the children, how is this affecting my children? Is it positive? Is it negative? Do I need to set a boundary here? Second, how does this honor my own time and energy, right? So say you do give up one of your parenting days. Say it's Friday because your co-parent wants to take them on some fun adventure and you say yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, amazing. But is this setting the expectation from now on every single Friday, they get your Friday and it's going to be very hard to get back because that's the kind of person they are? then sometimes the cost outweighs the reward, right? So we have to look at that too. We have to, based on your co-parents' patterns of behavior, based on your history with them, is this a smart idea? Because how this is honoring your own time and energy, this is important too, right? Yeah. And then three, what would a professional say in this situation? What would your divorce attorney, what would your divorce coach say? How would a family judge look at this situation, right? So if you kind of run it through the scenario, through those three questions, you can kind of almost come to your own answer. If not, then that's something that you would have to maybe talk to your divorce coach about. Because yeah. when it comes down to it, anything's possible. And speaking to someone is going to help be a sounding board and create awareness around a situation where you maybe wasn't wasn't there before. Yeah. And I love that. It's like allow, you know, almost allowing yourself to just lean into the support, you know, lean into that other people can support you and help you and understand and that they've been there before and they know how hard some of it is, but they've also gotten to the other side of it. And even if that side, the other side isn't like flourishing, they also have probably gone through, you know, gone through exactly what you're going through and can help you with that strategy to get to the other side. So you can keep some of that sanity, some of the sanity. Right, exactly. And that's why it's so important to create your support system when you're going through a divorce or a custody battle with a high conflict co-parent because you need to completely detach from that relationship. And then you need to find your tribe. You need to, even whether you need to hire someone to do it, right? To, to start, mm -hmm. you know, hire a divorce coach to help put you in uh, contact with your attorney that you might need, with your therapist that you're going to need, get plugged into a support group and learn from women or people or parents who have walked those steps before you, right? And can tell you, oh, I've done that. Let me tell you how. Oh, you're in that situation. 
I've, I've experienced that before. Let me tell you my experience, right? And it's so comforting to hear from other people who have gone through what you are going through and can just validate you and understand how hard it is, right? Right, yeah. I really enjoyed <laughs> talking to you and I feel like this was so informative and put so much into perspective. And I would love if you could share how people can find you and what divorce coaching you offer. So that if they're like, all right, I definitely need that support, they can reach out to you. Yeah, I do offer one-on-one coaching and it's kind of just whatever my clients need, whether it's methods of boundary setting, help with high conflict communication. If you're going through the family court system and you are going through a custody battle or preparing for mediation, I can help with all of that. And I can help you see a bigger picture of what your life is going to look like after your divorce. I help my clients connect with who they are when they're being their best self. And it really in touch with the characteristics and the tools that they need to help carry them through to the next chapter and beyond. And then I'm really passionate about helping parents find a way to minimize the impact of the divorce on their children, right? Because it would be totally unreasonable to say that that children aren't impacted by divorce. They are, and they grieve too. And so through my co-parenting certification, I learned specifically exactly the ages of the children and what they go through based on their age, what things to look out for, and the ways that you can help support them through that. So I do host a Wednesday night support group, and there's a link for that on my social media. My social media is my TikTok and my Instagram. I'm Coach Kind Mama. So you can find me at Coach Kind Mama on TikTok and Instagram. I have a website where you can book a free introductory 15 minute call with me to see if you'd like me to be your coach. And that's kindmamadivorcecoaching.com. Awesome. And I will definitely put all your links in the show notes so people can easily find them and find you. But thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Jessica. I appreciate you having me on. Tessa is such a wealth of knowledge. And we touched on this numerous times, but getting support is really important. And so if you're looking to work with somebody like Tessa, I highly recommend reaching out. Tessa can be found at kindmamadivorcecoaching.com. My website, as I'm sure you know by now, emotionalabusecoach.com. I'm just finishing up Tina Swithin's training on high conflict divorce and which definitely includes co-parenting with a narcissist. So we are both certified to help you and have been around the street and know what you're dealing with and having support and somebody in your corner is so important. And so if you are doing this alone, if you're reaching out to your lawyer constantly for advice, I highly recommend expanding that network. Mm -hmm.